All right, guys, welcome back to Revive School. We're continuing our study with the minor prophets. So far up to this point, we have gone through Hosea, Joel, and Amos. Hello to my three Amos friends. And now we're in a book called Obadiah. I have to tell you, I don't know any Obadiahs. Do you guys? Uh, I don't, but uh, Sheridan said she used to go to school with a kid named Obadiah, and she thought it was really weird. Kevin? Obadiah actually means, it's a prophet, okay? It actually means uh, servant of the Lord, okay? A lot of people take a different perspectives, but overall, that's what you're going to get. A servant of the Lord occurs 20 times in the Old Testament. It is, you ready for this one? The shortest book in the Old Testament. Nothing is known for certain about Obadiah. That's encouraging. At least 11 times the name is mentioned in the Old Testament with this name that's not the prophet. Uh, interesting enough, uh, uh, some would suggest, okay, that he belonged to the southern kingdom. Okay, some would suggest that he belonged to the southern kingdom because of mentions of Jerusalem or Judah and Zion. So in other words, he has more of a, a heart maybe and an awareness now, remember, Jerusalem is in the southern kingdom, okay, in Judah, even though he's up here in uh, the ten tribes where he's listed. So some would believe, and I'm just going to say this loosely, okay, some would believe he was a contemporary of Elijah and Elisha, meaning same, same times, okay, that they maybe would have known each other or known of each other. So you can try to go to a certain period of times so of when things happen, kind of, but you guys, it's really, really, really loosely. Many would say that Obadiah wrote after the attack on Jerusalem. I'm not even going to get into which one, okay? I'm just saying that they wrote after this is a possibility. Uh, let me just tell you this, okay? Because there are, Kevin, just so you know, in verses uh, 10 through 14, okay, of Obadiah, 10 through 14, okay, some of the issues that God has against Edom is that there was an assault and attack against Judah. Okay, so we know that he writes about a time period, right, that people, Edomites, came against Jerusalem, came against Judah. Okay, so here's why I'm saying this. There's four, four significant invasions that came on Jerusalem in the Old Testament history. So you have to determine which one of these invasions was he writing about in order to determine the time frame. Does that make sense? Kevin. Wasn't he a prophet? Couldn't it? been in the future? Yes, but he's writing about things that Edom has already done. One of the options of the invasions is by Shishak. <laughs> uh, have you guys seen that commercial? Yeah. My Shishak burned down, but it's covered. By Shishak, king of Egypt, during the reign of Rehoboam in 925 BC. <laughs> Shishak. That's a godly king. Um, so that would be one of the invasions. Okay, the king of Egypt in 925 went at during the reign of Rehoboam. Okay, maybe that was a time frame. One of the other invasions is by the Philistines and the Arabians between 848 and 841 BC during the reign of Jehoram of Judah. The reason we're saying these is you guys, you try to want to land when he's writing this so you know the context of who he's writing to, what does that look like. So that's why you're like, wow, who cares about when they are invaded? Because it kind of matters. Okay, now I don't know the official answer, nor does anybody else, just so you know. I'm just giving you options. So one of those, and just so you know, that one right there, a lot of people tend to lean towards. When the Philistines and the Arabians attack between 841 and 841 BC, and it's exactly what we have here in this time frame. Okay, up on our chart. Uh, another one is, which nobody really holds to, but by Jehoash, king of Israel. Okay, interesting enough. So when I say king of Israel, Kevin, then we're saying these guys are coming down here. Make sense? So his people are fighting against his people. That's kind of the imagery. Then you have uh, number four. Another people really lean towards this one as well, but they really like the second one more. But Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, at the fall of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. Four types of invasions uh, that took place into Jerusalem that Obadiah writes about in 10 through 14. All of this is so that you could have an idea of possibly when this took place. Okay? Um, kind of want to just leave it at that. There's a lot of 
there's a lot of backdrop that you could say, why wasn't it Nebuchadnezzar or why was it the Philistines and the Arabians? I don't want to get caught into all that. Just know that that's kind of the source that we look at. Now, here's what's interesting. One of the things I think is super bizarre about this whole text is if you look at this, okay? It, Kevin, can you go to Obadiah 1? Obadiah 1, it says the vision of Obadiah, right? Remember, the Lord gives Obadiah an actual vision, servant of the Lord. He shows him something. But now remember how I said most of the messages the prophets gave were always to his people, right? But this vision specifically says this is what the Lord God had said about Edom, okay? Now, in other words, this is going to come against the, the people that aren't of God is really what this comes down to, which is kind of interesting. You have a prophet declaring a word for the Edomites. Now, I want to go to Mindy's new painting here. Uh, this is kind of interesting. Okay, Mindy actually labels this Judges the Proud, okay, for Obadiah Judges the Proud. And basically what you have is, is that it, you're going to see a vision concerning the fall of Edom, okay, a nation that's against Israel, right? And so she says, I painted the rocks to look like the landscape in that time frame. Edom was a mountain dwelling nation in the clefts of the rock. We'll get to this, okay? But here's what's interesting. In verse three, Kevin of Obadiah, it says, the pride of your, your presumptuous heart has deceived you. You who live in clefts of the rock in your home on the heights who say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground? So the Edomites are all about, look at me, nothing's going to change. I'm fine. We're good. So the pride lifts them up. But what you're going to see is in this vision that Obadiah releases is that everything is going to come crumbling, crumbling down. So it's kind of a, an interesting picture. Uh, and, and, you know, again, in verse four, though you soar like the eagle and make your nest among the stars, from there I'll bring you down. God is constantly saying, every time you think you're something, God says, I'm going to turn you into nothing. But it's from Obadiah speaking into the Edomites. Okay. Well, who are these people, the Edomites? I want to spend quite a bit of time, honestly, in this, and then we'll get to the 21 verses in the only chapter of Obadiah. Edomites truly trace their origin to Esau. Okay? And so what you have is, is John MacArthur kind of gives us some personal background, and then we'll get into what we would consider like more of the location side of, of, of Edom. Uh, personal side is, is that, you know, uh, Esau, the firstborn son of Isaac and Rebekah. Okay? He was a twin. Okay, kind of interesting picture. And he struggled with Jacob even while in the womb. So you have, just so you guys have an understanding, Esau was a twin, and it's really Esau versus Jacob. Go to, Kevin, Genesis 25, verse 22, just kind of give you a picture here. Genesis 25, 22 says, but the children inside her struggled with each other. And she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. So there was this struggle that started at the very beginning. Esau's name means hairy. Okay. He was like a hairy garment all over. Edom also means red. Okay. So you have hairy, you have red. And then he was the guy, do you remember this? He sold his what? Do you remember this, Kevin? His birthright. He sold his birthright. So we know that he was the firstborn, right? So he traded his birthright to Jacob. Uh, do you remember, Rich, do you remember what he traded it for? Yeah, he traded it for a bowl of soup. Yeah, a bowl of soup. So he trades his birthright, which means he's relinquishing the favor as the birthright son, the first son. He said, I'm giving it up because I'm really hungry, right? That's really what it comes down to. Genesis 25, verse 30. Again, I want to build this up because nothing of Esau has he really walked into according to the plumb line, if you will. He said to Jacob, remember Genesis 25, 30, let me eat some of that red stuff because I'm exhausted. This is why he was also named Edom. Okay, so there it is. You see this Esau then was also named Edom. He was named Edom because of a bowl of stew. Uh, a couple other things. If you go to Genesis 26, verse 34. So you have Esau and Jacob. Okay, now, just so you guys know, I want to put everybody have this picture together. If Esau is named Edom, what's Jacob's name? Israel. Yeah, there you go. 
So now all of a sudden you have Esau being known as Edom and Jacob being known as Israel. Hence Israel versus Edomites. In Genesis 26, 34, then the Edomites began to even switch even more so. When Esau was 40 years old, it's interesting enough, 40 is a, a key age in a lot of scripture verses. When Esau was 40 years old, he took as his wives two people, Canaanite wives, Judith, daughter of Beeri the Hittite, and Basemath, daughter of Elon the Hittite. So he took two Canaanite women, right, you guys? And so all of a sudden, Kevin, he's now become two Canaanites. So now, Kevin, you see he's already strayed away, even in marriage, away from the Lord. They weren't supposed to marry foreigners. And now here you have Esau, who's become Eden, marries two Canaanite women. Again, just as a picture. Uh, and then can you go to Genesis 28, verse 9? Genesis 28, 9. I, I think this is important. This historical part is essential to understanding the word. So Esau went to Ishmael and married. In addition to his other wives, uh, look what he did. Mahalath, daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, she was a sister. So now, this is where it gets even more weird, you guys. He then, and this is kind of how you have to be, he now puts himself into the lineage by marriage of Ishmael's daughter. So, but here, here's to me, when you think of Esau and Jacob, I want you to start thinking of Edom versus Israel, but then Isaac versus Ishmael. Right? This is what you have. So you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So then think about this. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, this is really important to understand. So now all of a sudden Esau just put himself into the Ishmael family as well. He's done everything he can to literally avoid God's calling and purpose and lineage on his life and says, I'm going the complete opposite way. Correct? I'm going to marry the Canaanite women. I'm going to marry Ishmael's daughter. I'm going to involve myself in every single aspect. I think it's just kind of interesting. One other component, Genesis 25, 27. Uh, this is interesting. MacArthur brings this point out. I think it's a valid one. Uh, Genesis 25, verse 27. When the boys, boys grew up, Esau became an expert hunter and outdoorsman. Okay, but Jacob was a quiet man who stayed at home. That expert hunter and outdoorsman. Okay, here's where I want to go with this. I think this is interesting. He, he, uh, he, he was a man who was constantly outdoors. I know this is, uh, people that hunt, I have no problem with that. I'm not implying hunting and outdoorsman is, is wrong. Okay, but because of that, he became a man of open spaces. So if you go to Genesis 27, 38 through 40. Okay, Genesis 28, 30 through 40. Esau said, do you only have one blessing, my father? Bless me to my father. And Esau wept loudly. Okay. Then his father Isaac answered him, look, your dwelling place will be away from the richness of the land, away from the, die, the dew of the sky above. You will live by your sword and you'll serve your brother. But when you rebel, you will break his yoke for your, from your neck. So there's this image, Kevin, of his land is going to be completely different. Okay. If you go back to the description of the land again. Uh, verse 39, your dwelling place will be away from the richness of the land, away from the dew of the sky above. So Jacob, right? Isaac and Jacob are going to receive the land, the incredible land. What does Esau, Edom, receive? He receives like the, the land that's not the richness. Okay. And in this, in this description that we see in Obadiah, right? It's going to be um, these how does it describe it? Uh, it's in verse 3, I believe. The clefts of the rock in your heights. And that's not exactly like, yeah, it could be actually cool looking, but it's not like necessarily easy to live in. I was kind of thinking even, you know, it's the farm ground yeah. versus the desert. Really, there's no dew, there's no rain. There's nothing there. It's a good picture. Now remember, Israel and... Uh, Israel and Edom have become clearly against each other, right? I think that's, I think we've kind of established that. In Genesis 25, go to Genesis 25, 23. Just again, one more point here, just to prove this. Genesis 25, 23, this is really an interesting point. It says, two nations are in your womb. Two people will come from you and be separated. One people will be stronger than the other and the older will serve the younger. That's what we have. 
This is the picture of Esau and Jacob. Edom and Israel. Two nations are in your womb. How about that for a description? Two nations are in your womb. And by the way, the older is going to serve the younger, and it's not going to be great. There's always going to be a tension and a battle. So what does Obadiah do? Obadiah releases a vision that's going to come. Punishment is going to come to the Edomites. There's two nations. Clearly God's hand is on Jacob. God's hand is on Israel. God's hand is against Esau and Edom. It says in verse 1, the vision of Obadiah. This is what the Lord God had said about Edom. We've heard a message from the Lord. A messenger has been sent among the nations. Rise up and let us go to war against her. Okay, so here you have this. The word is coming out and he says this in verse 2. Look, okay, I will make you, make you insignificant among the nations. You will be deeply despised. He's talking to Edom. He's not talking, you guys, to this group right here anymore. Like if you were to have a map and it would just say, here it is, we're going to go to the Edomites. That's who he's saying. He says, I will make you insignificant among all the nations. You're going to be despised. In verse 3, your presumptuous heart, your prideful heart. In other words, judgment is now being declared. That's what's happening. Judgment is now being declared. Your prideful heart, your presumptuous heart has deceived you. You thought you were all that. You who live in the clefts of the rock, in your home on the heights, who say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground? In other words, who can touch us because of where we're located? They felt untouchable. Verse 4, though you seem to soar like an eagle, make your nest among the stars, even from there. If your nest is in the stars, I'll bring you down. It kind of reminds me of Amos, does it not? Remember this whole judgment that was going to come on to the actual people of Israel? You know, and they have this image of, you know, the fire or the locusts and all of these things are going to be coming against these people. And then they say, well, we can escape God's judgment, whether we go to Sheol or heaven, right? right this. And God says, I'm still going to find you. Even from wherever you're at, I will bring you down in verse 4. Verse 5, it says, if thieves, if thieves came to you, if marauders by night, how ravaged you would be. Wouldn't they steal only what they wanted? If grape pickers came to you, wouldn't they leave some grapes? Kind of an interesting uh, picture here. Verse 6, it says this. So they're going to be brought down because of their pride, but then also at the same context, the wealth that they think of it been established is going to be plundered. It says how Esau will be pillaged. His hidden treasures searched out. So even though you put maybe your treasures in here and down below and over a, a rock, it's going to all be discovered. Everything is going to be pillaged. Everything is going to be plundered. I mean, when we had this tornado, uh, you know, that came through Dallas, you know, he had nine or ten tornadoes in one night. You know, what's everybody doing? Everybody is boarding up their houses so that looters don't come in. And, and really what this is saying is, is boards won't keep people out. That, that's the image that we're having here. No matter how tough you think you are, you're still going to be plundered. Then it continues on. Okay, so you have this uh, image of you're going to be brought down because of your pride. Your wealth won't last. And then it says in verse 7, uh, it, it talks about this. Um, I think, who put this? Warren Wearsby put it this way. Your alliances are going to be broken. Everyone who has a treaty with you will drive you to the border. Everyone at peace with you will deceive and conquer you. Those who eat your bread will set a trap for you. He will be unaware of it. In other words, all of your allies, your neighbors, your tribes, they're all going to turn their back against you. Oh, hey, hey, would you like some bread? It's just a trap. Like everybody says, oh, yeah, I'd like to establish peace. No, nope, they're going to conquer you. Anybody who has a treaty, they're going to kick you to the border. Like this is the image that you will see. And oh, by the way, just so everybody's on the same page, this is Obadiah who's releasing a vision that he's seen from God to the Edomites. Who are the Edomites? Originally, their lineage could be traced back to Esau who sold his birthright because he was hungry. He then marries two Canaanite women, and then he marries into the family of Ishmael, who's not of the Lord. And then in all of this, the scripture says there's going to be two nations at war. Well, that was established from the very beginning. And God says, I'm going to take care of those people that are against my people. This is the image that you see in the book of Obadiah. It's only one chapter. It's the shortest book in the Old Testament. Verse 8, it says, in that day. And just so you guys know you're now going to be seeing wisdom that they had. <laughs> it's going to be destroyed. It's kind of a weird image. Wisdom, alliances, wealth, and pride. 
It says, in that day, this is the Lord's declaration, will I not eliminate the wise ones of Edom and those who understand from the hill country of Esau. Teman, uh, Teman is a name derived. This is interesting. If you go to Genesis 36, verse 11, uh, there's so much lineage that they keep tying back into family. Genesis 36, verse 11, Teman is the grandson, okay? The sons of Eliphaz uh, were Teman, Omar, Zepho, Gatum, and Kenaz. He's a grandson of Esau. Kind of an interesting picture that you have here. That's what you have with Teman. Teman, your warriors will be terrified. These are warriors, by the way. Will be terrified so that everybody from the hill country of Esau will be destroyed by slaughter. In other words, here's another picture here. The army, Kevin, will be defeated. This is probably one of the worst messages. That Edom, the Edomites are going to hear all of this. I'd tell Obadiah to take a hike, man. And that's usually what people do. Scripture then continues on. You're, you will be covered with shame and destroyed forever. And now you remember when we heard this, you guys, about the Israelites? I'm going to destroy you. But then what does he say usually, Kevin? Not yet. But, but there's going to be a little bit remnant. It's going to be a little bit of group. He just said you're going to be destroyed forever because of violence done to your brother Jacob. Man, I'm, I'm just telling you guys, this is years later, by the way. Years later, this lineage that was established from Esau and Jacob, nobody broke the, this generational sin that was ongoing. Literally, it, like it just kept going. Nobody said enough's enough. We're done with this. Let's turn to the Lord. The lineage of Esau just kept doing this. So he says, because of the violence done to your brother Jacob, you'll be destroyed forever. He says in verse 11, on that day, on the day, he says, by the way, you're guilty. You stood aloof on the day strangers captured his wealth while foreigners entered his gate and cast lots for Jerusalem. You were just like one of them. You jumped in. We're against my people. Verse 12, do not gloat, by the way. So in other words, they assisted in this process is my point. Remember how we talked about the invasion of Jerusalem? This is what we're getting into. You assisted them in this. Now, don't gloat over your brother in the day of his calamity. Don't rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their destruction. Don't most, mostfully mock in the day of distress. So think about this. Not only are they assisting in the destruction, but now they're rejoicing that everything's falling apart. This is why, if you're in a courtroom, why God says guilty. He gives you multiple reasons. In fact, he's going to give you four reasons of why judgment's coming to Edom. You guys rejoiced over my people. He says in verse 13, do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their disaster. Yes, you do not gloat over their misery in the day of their disaster. And do not, you're going to hear it three times, do not appropriate their possessions in the day of their disaster. You plundered, actually, the city, you guys. You plundered the city in verse 13. You rejoiced over Judah's downfall. And then Wiersbe even says, and then they stood withholding uh, and actually walked into and assisted in their downfall. This is why Esau is guilty. Finally, in verse 14, he says, do not stand at the crossroads to cut off their fugitives and do not hand over their survivors in the day of distress. In other words, you prevented actually from the escape of fugitives. You actually got in the way of people being set free. Guilty. He says in verse uh, 15 and 16, you see this so strongly in the book of Obadiah, the day of the Lord. For the day of the Lord is near against all of the nations. Now remember, the day of the Lord implies, here's what we have. Christ came the first time. There's a period of time. He hasn't come back. The second time, okay, he hasn't come back. So right before he comes back, is this tribulation. Seven years, peace three and a half, se uh, the other three and a half years is going to be hell, literally. Christ comes back, okay? There's the day of the Lord, Christ comes back. This is kind of the image, the image that we're talking about. And it says, the day of the Lord is near against all of the nations. So destruction's coming against the nations that do what? That turn against Israel. Edom, you're the prime example. That's what he says. You're the prime example. That's why I think Obadiah is an important book. He says, you've turned your back against me. And Genesis 12 says, if you curse my people, you will be cursed. Clearly, this is an example. As you have done, so it will be done to you. What you deserve will return on what? On your own head. This was a preview. I believe Edom was an example. And this is a really powerful statement, but you have to understand. Edom was a, an example for all of the other nations. You do not turn against my people. 
as you've drunk on my holy, I'm on verse 16, as you drunk on my holy mountain Zion, Jerusalem, so all the other nations will drink continually. They will drink and gulp down as be as though they had never been. It'll be like they didn't exist. They're going to experience a cup of God's wrath because they've turned against God's people. Verse 17, there'll be a deliverance, but there will be a deliverance. Now, he, he, Kevin, there's a finally, we got a message to the Jews. This whole thing has been for Edom. Now he says, I'm going to shift it to the Jews. There's going to be a deliverance on Mount Zion and it will be holy. The house of Jacob will dispossess those who dispossess them. Then the house of Jacob will be a blazing fire and the house of Joseph a burning fire, but the house of Esau will be stubble. They will set them on fire and consume, and consume them. Therefore, no survivor will remain of the house of Esau for the Lord has spoken. Just like it's going to happen on the day of the Lord, judgment's going to come against all the nations. If you turn against Israel, this is what's going to happen. There will be no survivors left. People from the Negev will possess the hill country of Esau. Those from the Judean hill, foothills will possess the land of the Philistines. They will possess the territories of Ephraim and Samaria, while Benjamin will possess Gilead. In other words, restoration is coming to the Jews, and God's going to give them the land. Why? Because he's going to have judgment on the nations. In 19, he says, uh, I'm sorry, in verse 20, the exiles of the Israelites who are in Halah, and who are among the Canaanites as far as Zarephath, as well as the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Shepharad, will possess the cities of the Negev. Restoration is coming to God's people. And then finally in verse 21, it's the coolest picture, you guys, that we have. Saviors, okay, will ascend Mount Zion. That word should make people creep out a little bit. Wait, whoa, multiple saviors. No, no, no. We're talking about people of God will ascend Mount Zion to rule over the hill country of Esau. So now God is saying, my people are going to rule over your land, Edom, because you're going to be destroyed. But the kingdom will be the Lord. So the people are going to come and rule. But Kevin, the big picture is what? The kingdom of God is going to be established. The kingdom of God is going to be established, which is why you have this king that's going to be established. So we're going to use this one phrase for all of Obadiah. There will be an established king that's coming. His name is Jesus. So yes, you're going to have the people coming in. You got a lot of verses in 1 Corinthians and uh, in Revelation. But the reality is, you guys, Revelation 11:15. 15. This is how I want to close this whole thing. All of the nations are going to stream. Judgment is coming and God's going to establish himself as an established king through Jesus Christ. Revelation 11:15 15 says the seventh angel blew his trumpet. And there are loud voices in heaven saying the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. You will see the establishment of the millennial kingdom through the established king, and his name is Jesus. You have two options, to fall in line with God <laughs> and support Israel, or walk away and choose to follow a false God, false worships, and not follow Jesus. And the scripture says, and if you don't support Israel in this process, judgment is coming to you as well. It's the book of Obadiah. It's a message for the nations, but I believe it's a message for today. We are to support Israel. And we're supposed to look for the established king, and his name is King Jesus. Have a great day. We'll talk to you tomorrow.